All right. Um, thank you so much for joining again for the second lecture of the Continual Learning on Machines That Can Learn Continually course offered at the University of Pisa in conjunction with Continual AI and the AI Doctoral Academy. Uh, to today, uh, we will delve a little more into the concepts related to catastrophic forgetting and interference, one of the main issues uh, of, um, of deep continual learning, let's say deep learning strategies and, and algorithms, if naively applied to the problem of continual learning. Um, so I wanted to start this lecture by asking you if you have some questions uh, related to the, to the past lecture, the introduction and motivation of the course. Um, I have also created a topic on our forum uh, so that we can uh, discuss in that thread uh, eventual questions that may arise even later. But if you have some now, we can uh, discuss them briefly uh, before going to the topics of today's lectures. Anyone from uh, from home? Okay, that's great. Um, so let's uh, jump right into it. Um, Today, we are going to start with the definition, the intuitive definition of forgetting, and then try to address it a bit more formally, um, understand it uh, at, the, at the core, let's say. Uh, and uh, so we're going to do that also with an ensign session, starting with this um, Google notebook that I prepared uh, for you, forgetting with not one neuron uh, that is uh, just trying to model a regression problem, linear regression problem that you can solve with a couple of parameters and um, um, start to understand forgetting just by looking at, at um, problems that may arise with just a couple of parameters, even one, if you will. <laughs> so we're going to see that uh, soon enough. Then we will move towards a slightly, uh, let's say, more complex example in which we have hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of different parameters and that is addressing directly one of the, I would say, most common toy benchmarks for continual learning that is uh, permuted MNIST, and possibly uh, starting to discuss how we can um, uh, create even a, an additional scenario that is very well known, that is split MNIST, trying to split these MNIST uh, digit recognition data sets, uh, very well known into the deep learning community, and transform it in a simple yet uh, complex, uh, in some cases, uh, continual learning benchmark. Uh, so we're going to see and explore forgetting even on, on this um, in this example uh, and uh, we will conclude the lecture uh, with an introduction to avalanche the reference tool that uh, you may use uh, for um, passing the exam and to work directly on your uh, continual learning problems uh, or even explore uh, different new ventures you know in the directions for uh, uh, regional algorithms in this area so let's start uh, the first part of the lecture about what's forgetting and, and uh, uh, where we can find it and, and what do we mean by that. Um, so let's start with, uh, with uh, let's say, a uh, thought experiment. Um, I think this is um, nicely conveying the main message behind uh, not, not only forgetting and the problems that may arise, but the, the idea of continual learning in general. So, so we have introduced continual learning in the previous lecture uh, a bit with a, with a more of an um, abstract term, so without looking at a possible example. So I wanted to start this lecture with this one uh, to even, um, you know, to, to, for the more practical people here to, to get the feeling on why we need it, even in, in practical today's applications, let's say. So let's say that we have a domestic robot, like the one that you can see here. Um, this is this, the, the first version, I would say, of the spot mini robot produced by Boston Dynamics and uh, you can see these um, videos online it's on YouTube uh, uploaded by by the same company uh, that was uh, sold a couple of years back by Google I, if I remember correctly and uh, if uh, this can get loaded um, you can see okay uh, this four-legged robot uh, moving around around uh, uh, even uncertain terrains and, and be able to generalize very well um, this, this ability of, of, of moving. Uh, I think this is not really using any, let's say, complex machine learning pipelines here. It's like a, a more of a control dynamics problem. Um, and um, okay, if you can see, okay, it, it, it is, um, I think, showing a uh, real powerful advancements in the robotics landscape that would be bring 
let's say, robots closer to us uh, in the near future. Um, and so I, I want to just start with this example, with the idea that if we allow ourselves to, to have uh, a few robots moving around us and in our domestic environments, then uh, these robots, uh, we may assume, have uh, several different sensors that produce a relevant amount of data every, every day, every hour, every second. Uh, and they encounter different objects uh, and the tasks they may have to solve, for example, putting uh, dishes and glasses into the dishwasher or taking uh, waste and, and um, taking care of it. Uh, you know, different things that we may imagine a system or a robotic system may do in our domestic environment. Uh, and uh, in our, um, um, let's say, in his daily activity, this um, robot may encounter several, for example, objects. Uh, over time that um, has never encountered before. So the, the, the domestic environment is uh, kind of, by definition, a stationary. Uh, we have a lot of objects that every day are introduced at home, objects that disappear, objects that change their appearances over time. And so uh, just looking at just a simple object recognition task, this is a nice, nicely, I think, conveying the, the, the message of, of continual learning, its utility in, in practical applications. So, um, I, 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 I'm sorry, I don't have the specific let's say, reference for this number, but I recall that um, um, it was uh, somehow discussed uh, in the past that as humans, we get around 50 gigabytes of data, streaming data every second to, to our, let's say, human five senses, right? So let's assume that we have a kind of the same uh, data streaming in our robot. Uh, it may be more, right? Because with robots, we are not limited in terms of number of sensors we can uh, add to our system uh, and the resolution of those sensors. So, for example, we may have a video 4K resolution even more. We don't have uh, like a fixed granularity and resolution like for the human sensings and biological um, developed sensors that are kind of fixed. Uh -huh. um, and, and they evolve just by, by the, the Darwinian, let's say, evolution uh, rules. Um, um, and let's say that we stick with this assumption that we have 50 gigabytes of, of uh, data every second. Then uh, um, after just a week uh, of, of being exposed to this uh, immense uh, streaming uh, data volume that we have like a, more than 30K terabytes of data. And so, so if we assume that we want our system to, to quickly adapt to the circumstances and situations, tasks or requests that we give to the system every day, then uh, if you think of this system being entirely trained with a, in a machine learning pipeline, uh, you would need to gather, accumulate all this data, and then we train, let's say, the spot mini brain from scratch uh, on, on this brain, right? And so uh, if you assume that you have um, um, a long, if not unlimited, lifetime span for this system, this robotic system, then uh, you get it, it, it's it's uh, reasonable to assume that uh, this is, is going to be not really scalable and, and even impossible to deploy with these conditions and without a continual learning strategy that will let the system update its brain more efficiently and, and with the scalability in mind. Um, so given this example, uh, I, I, I mean, it's not just a thought example, actually, it is something that uh, is being studied. And uh, for example, at the Italian Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia in Italy, uh, there is a, there is a border of a research group that is working on, uh, let's say, domestic robots that can get, that could build knowledge over time in an incremental fashion. And in this case, we see Giulia Pasquale and um, uh, from uh, from the, the IIT Technology Institute uh, that is teaching in this case the R1 model developed also in terms of uh, not only algorithms but hardware uh, at the same institute. Um, is showing different objects that the these agent, these robotic agents, should learn over time. Uh, and I, I show you these also because this system is entirely supervised. And I wanted also to convey the message that uh, even with purely, let's say, supervised learning, continual learning techniques, you can achieve impressive practical applications. Uh, and in this case, the robot is leveraging somehow a depth estimation based on a Kinect 2 sensor to uh, segment, let's say, the front, uh, the, 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 the object in front of, of the robot with respect to the background scene. Uh, and so the essentially the bounding box around the object can be automatically extracted uh, with that. And um, uh, Julia essentially through voice comments can 
um, give new examples to the robot that is able to collect those examples and retrain the whole system from scratch or just update the final classification layer or use a continuous learning strategy directly on device. So um, this is just to say that, that that first thought experiment that we addressed uh, may be quickly converted to something that works in real life. That is actually studied. It was a paper uh, from Pasquale and, and the rest of the of the team there um, that was published at IRAS in 2016. Um, okay, let's see if I can. Okay. Um, so, um, but if we are in this situation, where we encounter several objects, for example, over time, or better, examples related to different classes, different objects we would like to distinguish in our domestic environment, then it, it, um, if we assume that uh, in, in uh, a few days um, in a sequence we encounter different objects, then we cannot just continue backpropagation, fine-tuning our single model over these new examples that we encounter. So, and, and we uh, encounter instead uh, what is, is known as the problem of catastrophic forgetting. So in this um, animated GIF here, you can see um, um, an object recognition system that is trained on uh, 50 different objects encountered over nine different days, uh, for example. Uh, so in the first day, you encounter a set of, let's say, 10 uh, different objects that you can see here uh, depicted. Uh, then the second day, you encounter another five different objects, uh, I don't know, ad adapters, cans, uh, scissors, you know, different kind of, uh, of objects uh, that you can find in a domestic environment. The third day, you encounter another, another five objects, all different uh, from the previous one. And the objective of this learner would be to be able to distinguish all of those. There are 50 different objects. And so in the end, what we would like to assess is the ability of this uh, robot to distinguish 50 different objects. That is a 50-way classification problem, OK? Um, and, and we would like to give to this robot examples just uh, an handful each day, right, so related to these different objects and classes, as uh, Julia Pasquale was doing before. Uh, the problem is that if you assess the accuracy performance of this agent um, uh, say on an overall test set with this idea of assessing the ability to distinguish these 50 different objects, uh, of course you start with very low uh, recognition capabilities the first day since you have seen just 10 classes, but then you would expect the system to just improve over time and see these, uh, let's say, accuracy core uh, on the left side of this plot uh, grow over time. So as we give to the system more examples, more observations about these classes, you would uh, appreciate if the system is able to actually improve its ability to recognize all these and distinguish these 50 different objects. But that's not the case. Uh, and if you just continue that propagation, you see that the overall accuracy core here is flat. Uh, and what we are doing here is essentially uh, learning about the distinguishing the different objects, different uh, classes we see in the current experience using the terminology we had, we had introduced in the first lecture. That is that day we encountered just examples of these five different objects, for example, in the second day. And we update our model and we are able now to distinguish those, but we forget completely about recognizing the first, let's say, previous 10 classes we have introduced in the first day. And you can see these and you can appreciate it better um, uh, looking at the, let's say, evolving confusion matrix on the right, where these vertical bands indicate that uh, the network, the model is only guessing among the newest classes uh, it has encountered. Uh, so um, in our case here, we are assuming that the first 10, let's say, uh, the first 10 um, classes have labels from zero to 10, then we have the second, let's say, batch here uh, of labels that from, from 10 to 15, and so on and so forth. So you see that the, the uh, kind of, these kind of uh, vertical bands are shifting towards the, the, left, the right, because as we move on in this um, exploration, let's say, um, and this stream of experiences, we learn how to recognize, let's say, to guess only among these uh, five um, uh, different classes. So this is um, uh, an example on, on how you encounter forgetting in a, let's say, um, simple practical problem. Uh, but uh, um, I mean, um, forgetting is a phenomenon that can be somehow um, 
uh, think, uh, uh, let's say, uh, discuss with an, a more, let's say, general dilemma that is called the stability plasticity dilemma. So a concept also well known within biological learning systems where uh, it is difficult somehow to uh, develop uh, a system that is able to um, remember past concepts and learn new concepts at the same time. Uh, somehow understanding what's biased information that should be removed and what should be preserved. But even more, um, let's say, uh, uh, difficult would be to be able to generalize over time. So um, um, uh, taking into consideration of the observation you encounter uh, in, in time and be able to find a common denominator that would not uh, conflict with these observations and, uh, and um, so be able possibly to generalize to examples you have never seen before. Um, and uh, but well, while this is a, a more let's say a, of a, of a trade-off that is known also in nature, um, with the graded ascent uh, trained neural network, we often uh, we are often skewed towards too much plasticity. That is, we are just uh, able to quickly uh, learn from uh, new data, but we suddenly erase all the previously information uh, uh, encoded in, in our weights. And this is called catastrophic forgetting or interference of the new learned information with the previously learned one. Uh, so um, before getting into um, looking why this is happening for machines, I wanted to stress here the fact that forgetting is indeed something that is not just related to machines, rather, but, but this is, it is part of the very nature of learning and while we often say in, in continuous learning this is something bad, uh, forgetting as a, a, an important value uh, uh, for learning systems in general, um, as it is important to forget uh, biased information that may acquire over time, it is also important to forget in terms of efficiency. You cannot remember everything and waste uh, important resources to remember things that are not useful to reach a particular goal anymore, right? Or uh, in general, the world is changing, so it, 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 it does make sense to change some assumptions that you made and some things that you learn if the world is not reflecting anymore that kind of knowledge. Uh, so there are many reasons why forgetting it is actually important. Uh, but since we, 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 we are focusing, uh, uh, we know that at the moment forgetting is one of the main problem issues arising from gradient-based uh, trained neural networks, then we focus on that and to remove it somehow, to tame it. Uh, but if you look at humans, that we can say it's one of the best systems today that we know of uh, in terms of a, a good trade-off in terms of stability plasticity dilemma, then um, uh, we we look at these systems and we can, uh, through empirical observations and findings, you know, uh, testing on humans, we can see that forgetting follows a power law uh, decay. So if you teach a, a person, you know, a particular concept, then this concept, if it's not um, uh, repeated somehow, and it's not particularly valuable in terms of, uh, you know, company emotions that you get, like a particular failures or uh, simulations from the external environment, you quickly forget about this. Uh, but at, at the same time, uh, you do not completely erase that information. So that's kind of a, of a trend over time of forgetting for humans. What's interesting to, to note, and this is was studied in several recordings with humans, as well as model, um, for example, in this re uh, relatively recent uh, near Rips paper by Mozer and the team, is that uh, um, in general, if you repeat the exposure to particular uh, observations, this is uh, very much, let's say, linked to a better memory consolidation. Uh, and this is also something that I think you can also recall from your, let's say, um, more uh, childhood experiences when you had to, I don't know, memorize a poetry, right? So you memorize it, you're able to say it back out loud, but then the next day you you have forgotten it, right? <laughs> but then um, if you repeat that with uh, after a particular interval in time, then you're more likely to remember it later on in your life. Hmm? And if you repeat that with a delayed, more and more delayed times, uh, intervals, then you never forget about that poetry. I don't know if you had this experience, but I had when I was in childhood. I think it's very um, important to link this idea of forgetting and memory consolidation to the reoccurrence of experiences, right? Uh, but it's something that is somehow not uh, really discussed uh, in, uh, in continuing learning at, up to, to this point. Uh, yeah, just to, to quickly move on on this, uh, so we, uh, in this paper and, and uh, evidence from humans, uh, so if you repeated the same concepts, uh, the same concepts in two different, uh, let's say, training sessions, 
uh, the interval uh, with respect to uh, these two lectures would impact the ability to recall after a long time these concepts. So, and, and the, the, the let's say the core uh, for recalling these concepts uh, followed based on the let's say the, the amount of uh, let's say of days, a time that intercourse for, uh, between the two lectures. It follows this uh, this kind of uh, solid line. So, if you, um, you you can find let's say a reasonable distance across the repetition of concepts, so that. Uh, the let's say the recalling ability after a, a bit of time is the highest, and then if you just, let's say put these lectures, these reoccurrence uh, uh, so far um, apart, then you may end up having uh, still uh, not uh, not um, um, let's say the opposite um, uh, effect. So you you are actually not recalling this information so so well anymore. Um, and this was model, uh, let's say, um, in these papers. So you, if you're interested, you can uh, look into it. I think it's very interesting, especially to understand how memory consolidation is happening in humans and why it is important also to forget. <laughs> um, OK, so in, uh, in uh, let's say, neural networks, uh, forgetting is uh, indeed uh, uh, a more, let's say, of, a, of an issue, seen as an issue. and. Uh, is uh, described as the tendency of artificial neural networks to completely and abruptly forget. So that's the, one of the greatest issues, right? So it's not gradual, it's abrupt. And if you look at uh, different, let's say, empirical investigations of this, what happens is that you not only forget about the past, but you're also doing worse than random guessing in some cases. <laughs> so it's really uh, dangerous and, and negative in terms of, of, uh, of um, uh, let's say backward knowledge when you learn about a particular new task, um, and this is mostly due to the very nature of stochastic gradient descent, a gradient descent in general, uh, and uh, where, where you let's say widely and and consistently change all the weights of your uh, parametric function to suit only the uh, current loss you are minimizing, right, uh, and the, the surface you are considering, um, and so. Um, I think this uh, image here on the left uh, nicely uh, summarized this idea uh, graphically, and it was taken from the seminal work overcoming catastrophic forgetting in your network. So, if you have, uh, for example, a couple of tasks that we encounter uh, over time, and the first task is A, the second is B, uh, and you learn normally as you would do with classic static um, machine learning, uh, gradient descent algorithms, how to minimize your loss so that uh, you get to these optimal weights uh, on the first task, theta A star. Then if you encounter a second task that has different, let's say, loss surface uh, that you want to minimize, if you don't have access anymore to the loss function, the training data of the previous task, A, what do you, what, let's say, the, the, the gradient ascent algorithm would do normally is to just move, uh, taking the gradients uh, that you get through um, um, your, your backpropagation algorithm, then uh, you would move towards the minimum of these uh, surface loss. Uh, and so you would get towards maybe this uh, yellowish, uh, let's say, area uh, on the right, uh, following this, uh, let's say, blue curve. Uh, so essentially what you're doing is to erase a bit or change, let's say, the best way you can, uh, the, 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 the weights that you, the optimal weights you computed the step before, on the experience before, on the task before, and move directly, uh, you know, towards the, the best solution to solve the task B. But then, uh, uh, depending on the different, you know, uh, loss surfaces, then this may completely disrupt the knowledge related to the previous one. And uh, so uh, you may end up, end up in this point in space where you're not able to minimize anymore uh, the loss on the first task. Then you can add maybe some regularizer, general regularizer would somehow tame a bit this effect, but uh, you mean that you don't have any guarantee, let's say, that you will in, end up in a situation, uh, let's say, on a, on a part of, of this loss surface that will minimize both uh, losses. So uh, you may end up, for example, here at the end of this um, uh, green green uh, um, um, arrow, while uh, what we would instead uh, have, if it as exists, uh, is would be to move towards. Uh, um, um, the space in which both losses are minimized. So this is what we said also in the in the introductory lectures with this L of S loss. It would somehow be the the overall intended loss for our continuous learning objectives. Minimize all the losses of the different tasks we, and experiences we encounter um, over time. 
And the problem is that, of course, that we don't have access to neither the uh, test data nor the training data anymore of the previous experiences. So we, we, we have only to approximate this L of S function. Uh, and, and, and there are many ways we see in the methodologies lectures on how we can actually do, the, do this. Okay, so uh, at this point you may uh, ask yourself, right? But um, okay, why, 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 why don't we just wait for the next experience, right, in time, and uh, just accumulate all the data and retrain everything from scratch, as we always done in uh, in machine learning, right? <laughs> so we just wait, we just wait. So, um, um, so my obje objection, let's say, to this is that, well. First of all, uh, remember the thought experiment we discussed before. Sometimes maintaining a, a lot of data is not the best way to do things. It's definitely um, not the, the most efficient way in terms of both memory and computation. But one could argue, okay, I don't, we don't really have this problem at, at the moment. We can allow ourselves to maintain all the, the data memory sometimes, and we can also allow to spend a bit more of computation. Um, that's definitely true. Uh, but but the problem is that uh, uh, this t, let's say, value may be, and it often is uh, for computer learning problems, unbounded. So you can you you have to think. More, let's say more of a way, not not just to solve a particular you know sequence of tasks, but rather this idea of moving from t to t plus one. So that's that's the main objective of continual learning. It's not solving a fixed set of of uh, experiences or tasks, but rather to be able to as soon as you have a new set of examples, experiences, and new losses to minimize is to add it quickly and build on top of what you have previously uh, done. So it kind of uh, reminds me or of a form of dynamic programming in a sense. But um, um, it's uh, it's it's exactly the focus of continued learning is exactly this. And uh, by the way, we, we are going to explore different baselines on uh, that um, we, we will compare with our methodologies in continued learning that are also based on this idea of storing uh, examples that we encountered before and do the best we can with those. Uh, but uh, yeah, as a, as a quick hint on, on, on that, uh, it, it's, um, uh, it is, let's say, prune, approved, uh, shown empirically that if you just collect all the data you acquired so far, uh, then you um, add the band, let's say, new batch of data that you encounter and at uh, time t plus one, then if you start from the previously learned model, then this is underperforming with respect to the idea of storing everything and uh, start again the training from scratch. So that if, if that's the case, then uh, you can see that uh, how wasteful it is to get in a continuous learning scenario to the best possible performance in terms of accuracy, for example. It's very wasteful. Every time you need a, a, an update, even on a slightly piece of new data, so a couple of examples more that you want to integrate, you need to start from scratch if you want to maximize the, the accuracy and the performance of the system. OK, so I think that uh, that's uh, that's uh, more than uh, than um, than enough um, in terms of theory we can get uh, get our ends a little dirty if you will and uh, so if you have your laptop you can uh, use it now uh, we're gonna go through a notebook together uh, on google collab i'm gonna show you and uh, well i'm gonna uh, let's say run all the different cells here for those of you that don't have the notebook, and so don't worry uh, if you don't have it, but I think that is a bit of a flexibility. You can think of run it yourself in parallel, uh, and I'm going to explain everything step by step. OK, so let's see. Um, so you can, uh, so for, for, do, for doing this in parallel, you need a Google account. And uh, so if you have that, you can just uh, go on um, on um, on Google and search for Google Colab. And once you you are there, uh, you can uh, look for the GitHub um, tab here. And uh, this nice feature from uh, Google Collaboratory allows you to pick a particular organization, in this case, Continual AI, and look for the different repos and run eventually the notebooks contained within the repo. So this is very cool. It's just a way you can you can look for different cool uh, notebooks around the GitHub in general. But in in our case, we're going to use the notebooks contained 
within the Colab uh, repository, that is this collection of uh, notebooks that we are trying to develop together collaboratively uh, within Coutinho AI. And if you click on the repository Colab, you get access to a number of possible uh, showcasing notebooks about continual learning. So thanks for all, to all the people that actually contributed. Uh, but for, for us in this course, we're gonna focus uh, first on this notebook for getting with one neuron uh, here. And what you can do is to just use this uh, open notebook in new tab uh, action link. So if you click on it, this uh, opens uh, a, a new session on Google Collaborative uh, um, <laughs> Collab that you can run asynchronously with respect to the other people. And it's it's completely a separate machine, virtual machine that is, a, uh, let's say, gifted to you by, by Google <laughs> for a limited time span. <laughs> um, OK. So while you set up your, your notebooks uh, and, and uh, on your laptop, especially for, I guess, the people that um, have not really a strong background in ML, I will just uh, cover a little of the, the reg linear regression, let's say, theory that uh, we're going to use in, uh, in this notebook. So essentially, uh, I'm starting from um, quite known, I would say, examples um, uh, for linear regression. It was also the base um, example used in the machine learning course by Andrew and Go at Stanford and at Coursera. Uh, so essentially, this uh, task, what we are trying to do is to model the prices of, of a particular real estate uh, based on the size in terms of um, feet square uh, <laughs> uh, for, for um, these different uh, American houses. And um, so the idea here is that you can nicely correlate the sides of the great um, living area, living room of these houses with respect to their um, prices. And this is reasonable, right? If you have a bigger room uh, in the center of your house, probably a, a, a bigger house and a, a nicer home. Um, and so uh, we will see that this is, let's say, nicely correlates in a sense that we can have a linear model, just a straight line that is somehow modeling these um, uh, all these examples that we see, um, and so the the math, the math behind it is uh, is quite simple. Uh, I have also linked uh, these uh, linear regression nodes that were very nicely done by Roger Gross uh, from the University of Toronto in a, in a related course at Toronto University, um, and I think it in, in a couple of, of pages nicely summarized the, the all the information you need for linear regression. And essentially, you can, of course, define your, your model as uh, uh, a straight line in a simpler case in which j, j is just one. So you have y equals m, our um, angle with respect to the to the x-axis of the straight line, and x, uh, our independent variable, plus the bias uh, is the point in which the, the straight line intercepts the y-axis, as you may recall from high school. And uh, and um, so once we have defined a particular rest function, the simplest one being the mean square error, that is how far our prediction y is from a target prediction, the label related to the, to these um, these examples. Uh, uh, squared and uh, divided by two, a common a common way to um, define a loss for this um, case. And then we can define our overall, let's say, loss um, and error uh, just as uh, the sum uh, over these losses of all the possible training examples and uppercase n, right? So if we go uh, on and we change this equation, the actual way in which we compute the y value, right, the prediction of our neural network, then we plug into this our uh, linear regression. You can forget about this sum. In our case, we're just going to have uh, two parameters, one neuron, that is with two parameters, the bias and the actual weight. And, um, and then you get this final, let's say, um, overall loss that you want to minimize, right? Then uh, since we want to change the, the weights um, that are just the, the main um, um, angular variable for our um, um, straight line and the bias, then 
we, sh we can just compute the partial derivative for these two um, parameters. And you can go through the, 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 the chain rule and then get these, um, these values maybe as a, as a normal work at home. But in the end, you get this nice way of computing, very simple in terms of computationally, to compute the, to do the, uh, the, the, the gradient, compute the gradients, uh, so that you can then update uh, with the sequence of uh, iterative steps, you can get to the optimal weights for this particular regression problem. So once you have computed these uh, um, the gradients, uh, that is simple. Simply the x corresponding x value uh, times the error in terms of the difference with respect of our prediction and the uh, target. Then um, you can um, update your weights uh, with a particular learning rate alpha, and moving in the opposite direction of the of the of the gradient. Then you can uh, minimize. Um, step by step, your overall loss that we described here, okay? And then you can, of course, uh, this is important that you can see the, the impl actual implementation now in a second, uh, to, uh, we, you, you can vectorize, let's say, this uh, process just by adding a dummy input x0, like a column in an hour, in our, let's say, um, table of examples, which always takes the value one, uh, and then this way you can model, let's say, the partial derivative in, in an uniform way, right? So you can say that uh, W0 now becomes our bias and models the whole bias, and then uh, the, actual, the actual X0 term is always one, right? So in the end, you can model um, the update rule in a simple way, just having this X term being the number of examples in the rows. Uh, the first column is the is the W1 that is uh, corresponding to M, angular uh, parameter, and the second uh, row is uh, is all ones, so that you, you get in the end with a simple um, transpose here, a uh, single multiplication, uh, matrix multiplication, you get uh, the actual update row. Okay, so uh, you can look at the notes uh, from Roger if you are uh, doubtful about uh, particular steps in this case, but this is going to be like, this is a normal case of linear regression, just one, one neuron and uh, for addressing the out prices estimation problem. Okay, uh, yeah, okay, I don't have any more slides here. We can move to the actual notebook. So, Then I promise after the notebook we could take a little break. <laughs> um, um, but then this notebook is um, just starting uh, with these standard, let's say, data sets for these um, house prices estimation. And uh, so what we are going to do differently is uh, just build a continuous learning setting. That is, we're going to split this data set in two parts so that we then we, we try to train on the first part, then we update the model on the second part and we see how it performs on those two, let's say, different splits. Um, and so, ideally, what we would like to do is to model the problem the best way we can so that we can, let's say, reasonably estimate the prices for the houses of both splits. Um, and so, um, we're going to see, to start, just uh, what are the, the ideal training parameters for the linear regression on the overall data set. And then we'll see if we have instead these two splits in a sequence, what happens and if we can see forgetting on those. Okay, so um, I'm gonna try here to execute uh, one cell at a time. So let's start by uh, remo removing, mm, okay. So I think it was, okay, clear all outputs. And then we're gonna, uh, okay, just run every cell. Okay, no problem, I have done it. <laughs> um, okay, and then it takes a little while just to connect the virtual machine to your notebook. Uh, you can, of course, uh, look at the, the properties, let's say, of your system here of the, um, of the virtual machine. Uh, you can also change the runtime environment using GPUs or CPUs, or you, can, you get, um, uh, you can you can explore this at home, uh, playing around with this notebook uh, as uh, an assignment. Uh, then after a bit of imports and a couple of, of uh, let's say, settings that I'm not going to go through, what we do is to just download the, the data set. Uh, so 
What's nice about Google Colab is that you actually have a Linux machine behind you, so you can run also commands directly, like having a shell using this bank command, these exclamation points. So in this case, we just use wget, and we we got this house prices train CSV as our main data set. So you can also check uh, here in the, uh, let's say, files tab that we, we have actually downloaded, and now I think it's it's really nice. Um, was a time in which Google Colab wouldn't uh, let you show the data in a reasonable way. Now I think with a double click you can just see them without uh, problems. So you, you you can see that these are these are the kind of data we that we download. So a series of row, uh, rows. For every uh, row you have a different house, and for each house you have a, se a sequence of attributes that are interesting for uh, modeling your your own estimation. Okay. Uh, for example, you know when the the house was uh, built and, uh, and how big is the the actual um, living area and so on and so forth. Okay, then um, okay if we uh, use uh, pandas uh, in this case to read the CS view and get a nice description with this describe uh, method that uh, pandas is offering. Uh, then we, we get uh, an idea on, on an exploration of those data. For example, we see that there are one, uh, one uh, K and 400 uh, different houses we have in this data set, and we see all the different, uh, let's say, computed attributes uh, for each of those, uh, um, well, uh, let's say, statistics re related to all these attributes. I don't know, for example, the average, uh, the year is uh, is um, 1971 for all these houses. Okay. Then uh, we can also select a particular uh, a particular um, uh, attribute that is uh, most interesting to us. It's going to be our target. That is a sale price, um, and uh, and we we get a few more details about uh, different person um, well. Um, percentile and um, and uh, mean average standard deviation for the sale price. So we can see that the average for uh, a, a home that is here in the US is uh, 180K, <laughs> uh, kind of in line, I guess, um, with our prices here. I guess it's not in California. <laughs> um, okay, and then, uh, okay, if we if we plot, uh, let's say, the distribution of those uh, prices, uh, we see that there is like a, very, like a nice normal distribution with this long, uh, long uh, tail here uh, reasonably um, with uh, a few exceptions of a few houses that are very costly, right? Mary? Okay, then um, what we will do here is to plot uh, the, let's say, relationship of, for all of these examples of the great living area, one attribute of this big data set with respect to the same price. And we can see what we, we said before, right? In, in also practically, if you look uh, these, um, at these examples, you see that there is a kind of a, a nice correlation, linear correlation with, with, with respect to the two. And you have, of course, a few outliers, but, but in general, we, we can say they are directly correlated. Um, then uh, now, if we want to, to create like two different splits, let's say two experiences to model this idea that maybe you are uh, um, someone's uh, selling houses, right? So at, at some point you, you want a model to describe the prices of your uh, of your home. Uh, for example, you are in, in the year 2000 and you say, okay, up to this point, I would like to have a model that is able to predict given the, the, the size of a home, the living space of our home, how much is going to cost, right? And what I can tell to my clients, right? Okay, I want to give you an estimate on how much you're going to sell uh, your home based on just how big it is. Uh, so that's nice. I can create this model, but then after a few years, I get a few more examples, right? Because I'm selling houses over time after 2000. So I get a few more examples. And in the end, what I would like to do is to update my model, my prediction model, to give you a more accurate estimate that is taking into consideration your examples accumulated after 2000. Uh, so this is a, a normally a real example, just that uh, normally what we would do is to just, okay, uh, accumulate all the data and retrain the model from scratch, right? That is what we do, a normal data scientist <laughs> working on this. Um, uh, so, given that we assume this is a nice problem to solve uh, for continual learning, we can create this new, let's say, that separate 
data sets uh, related to these different experiences. Sorry if I didn't use the nomenclature, appropriate nomenclature here, but uh, yes, we have, um, uh, let's say, a data set containing all the examples related to the houses that are old before 2000 and the houses that are new after 2000, okay? So if we look how the, the properties, let's say, to these two houses, well, let's see that in Perl. Um, for example, okay, well, uh, the, 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 well, we get this um, confirmation. Let's say that the year build for the for the old houses is uh, 1960, uh, and uh, for the new houses is 2005. So we get these two now distributions across these years. And of course, if you look at the, okay, maybe we can just uh, plot the different sets. Okay, so what you can see is that for the new ICs, you have, uh, let's say, higher prices in general, even for lower sides in terms of uh, living space area. And for older houses, you get uh, more, let's say, uh, <laughs> um, let's say uh, oh, as you would expect, let's say, uh, less advantages, let's say, selling uh, price um, estimation. Um, so you, you can already see that these are these are somehow two different uh, distributions of, of data that we have um, created starting from the single data set and then they would need different let's say estimation mode regression models okay so what i what i'm doing this cell sorry if i uh, didn't explicitly that uh, here uh, is to add the infamous uh, column uh, with the with just one. So this this uh, uh, actual let's say instruction here is just a way to say okay uh, start from the from the X uh, let's say overall X data set uh, with all the new houses. Just considering the um, um, spade the, the the feet square uh, measure of the the living area. And add an additional column that is just once, okay? So that we can use that trick we, we said before. So in the end, you have just uh, the overall number of examples related to this problem and two columns. The first column, the size in, uh, of the feet square of the living space area, and second column, just once, okay? So then we can define our loss, as we said uh, previously in the, in the slides, as just uh, you know the difference, square difference of the prediction and uh, the the actual um, label. Um, then you normalize this by the, the number of uh, possible examples, and uh, you return these values. Essentially, no problem. What we would expect. Then we can define our own, let's say, object linear regression that is just implementing. Um, uh, uh, the predict function and the gradient descent step, uh, and plus, uh, let's say, a more high level function, this uh, fit, as you would use in uh, scikit-learn. I don't know if you know the, the tool, but essentially it offers you the ability to just, given a, a set of examples, X and Y, to fit a classifier on, on those. Um, so what um, we define is um, essentially our weights as an attribute of this class, Big W here, um, and uh, we start from two, two, two zeros. Um, you can initialize with random values as well. And then we have additional, let's say, um, attributes here that they just useful for plotting and storing, let's say, partial um, version of, of a solution, of a linear regression solution, so that we can uh, use this history to compute nice plots later on. Then the predict function takes as input just a, a set of new example or one example or more examples, so this uh, living space area, and then uh, uh, multiplies it with uh, our weights, right? As you would expect, a linear combination, linear regression, and then you get uh, you get from this prediction your estimated price value. Hmm? Uh, then the greedy descent step um, uh, essentially takes all the predictions on the, on the training set that we give in input and uh, computes the error and then does that uh, compute mutation of the gradient as we have seen in the previous formula as just the uh, dot multiplication, matrix multiplication using NumPy here of the transpose of the X uh, matrix and the error just computed, normalized by the number of examples, okay? Then um, we do the actual, let's say, step 
um, in the gradient descent. So we multiply the gradient with learning uh, rate and then we subtract the, 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 um, the value to the actual for each of the, the actual weights. OK, then the defeat function, uh, this high level function is just taking as input all these uh, these example at once. So it is like a, not, a, not a stochastic gradient descent here. We are just doing batch uh, gradient descent with all the training set. Uh, just to 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 that get quicker <laughs> quickly uh, to to the actual minimum of the loss, and um, so we we loop over uh, the different training iterations. In this case, one hundred thousand iterations, and uh, what we do is just compute a prediction step, compute the the, the cost uh, the, the loss, uh, and then uh, update our let's say um, more of a descriptive uh, set of attributes, compute a gradient descent step. Uh, with a particular learning rate and um, yeah, take into account and say collect all the different values of y so that we can study later. I don't remember if I okay, I run this okay. Um, then if we have defined the linear regression uh, model this way, we can instantiate it and then use the fit function uh, so that as you can see, we we get directly the value, the optimal value of the weights w1. So the our angular value and the bias term. Okay, um, and these are the optimal solution for the overall problem, house estimation problem, or the accumulation of all these um, old and new houses. Hmm? Then, um, if we plot here the the loss function given uh, the nice uh, cost history that we accumulated over time, then we get this uh, very smooth let's say trajectory of the loss so this is very nice the, the task is quite simple and uh, we have done it also to batch it's, it's a great in the sense so it's uh, it's very let's say um that it, it doesn't have a lot of um of, of noise in it uh, and you can see that actually all these different iterations are not really needed so we get to the actual solution of the problem uh, much uh, quicker um then here I won't go into details here, but uh, you can define an animate, let's say, function uh, that it's just useful to to then show to you um, uh, an animation of the actual straight line uh, progression as we change the act the actual um, values of the weights. Uh, let's see if we can get that. Uh, OK, so what, what happens is that we start by, um, do you recall, we started with zero uh, being the, the M angular value and zero also the bias. So the, the, this is, uh, let's say, um, straight line corresponding to the, to the X axis. And then as we move towards, let's say, lower uh, magnitude of value of the loss, then what we would expect is to move towards a better representation and estimation of these examples, right? So um, I think this is the best way to do. Okay, so every step that we make, I don't think uh, every step. I don't. I don't think it's um, an actual iteration. Uh, but yes, after a few iteration you get nearer and nearer to the actual optimal solution, as you can see here. And he slowly you converge to the best solution to describe the problem. Yeah? So this is just what you would expect from uh, from a normal linear regression algorithm. Okay? Then let's start to consider, uh, so again, and you know, uh, we have seen the best parameters here, 9.94 and one18 uh, for uh, the M value and the bias term respectively. So if we instead start looking at the at the let's say um, different data sets, uh, we we said we can uh, build by splitting the main data set for house price estimation. Then uh, we do the same tricks of adding, of course, uh, the the column with all ones, and we get. 1,000 is a bit also unbalanced. 1,000 uh, examples for the old houses and just 300. That is our update, our new set of houses we have encountered after 2000. Uh, then, if we train a completely new model on the old houses only, you see that we get different numbers here, different optimal numbers. Um, 
with respect to the the, the optimal say way in which we can pretty we can create this straight line um, representation uh, of the correlation. Then, if we run our animation function again. I don't why it takes so so much. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, in this um, animation, you see that the, the the blue, I think the blue ones were the the dots related to the wall. Let's say that the set. Let's say and and the yellow ones are just the examples related to the new houses. Oh, oh no, sorry. The the blue ones are the um, um, old houses and the the yellow one are the new ones. Uh, but now we are trying to model, right? We have trained these um, this model just to fit the old one uh, that you can see is this optimal, I think. Uh, let's see. So even in this case, oh, maybe we can do this. Okay. Oh, okay. So the uh, green one was the the optimal, let's say, um, uh, regression model for the overall uh, examples of the, of the training of the data set. Uh, while for better representing just the old houses, the blue dots, uh, you get this optimal instead uh, red line at the end of the iterative procedure. <laughs> and I think I stopped this. Then this is that what happens uh, fitting only the new examples, the yellow uh, lines, starting from the same model, right, that we have seen before. So we are not starting from scratch this time. We are fitting the same model, uh, adding uh, 150 iterations here with just the new data. We get, again, uh, different numbers as well. So this is the plot of the loss over time. So this was the first, let's say, task of modeling the first experience continue, containing only examples related to the old houses. Then we added the new houses. The loss suddenly uh, was up again because uh, we were computing the loss on different uh, uh, examples and then through a training procedure we would converge to this solution instead. And so if we look at the animation overall, I didn't recall it was uh, so much computer to, to be done. <laughs> Let's wait just a couple more seconds. As I think the animation, it's, it's quite nice to see at the end. And so what we would expect, yes, is to see the overall animation uh, Firstly, first starting to model, let's say, the, the old houses, right, with the best red curve that uh, is the first position, um, and then move suddenly with the update towards this new uh, linear regression model that is able, as you can see, to better describe the new examples. And the problem is that, as you can see, that uh, even if we keep uh, doing this in an iteration, so we move from one set to the other and then the other to the, to the previous one and so on and so forth, we would never get to these green points. So you can take this as a nice exercise to do at home. So if you keep tr training, you know, with the uh, these alternation of losses, you wouldn't you wouldn't get to the actual best value that would represent the overall um, uh, estimation prices um, problem. So this is an example, uh, just a simple example. In this case, uh, it even we can consider one parameter. As you can see, the bias is almost fixed to zero. Uh, that uh, is showing you how uh, forgetting operates with standard gradient descent uh, that you can build just with uh, without complex frameworks such as PyTorch, just uh, with uh, with Python and then NumPy. And uh, you can use this notebook just to investigate this better. For example, uh, a, ni a nice thing that they uh, wanted to integrate, I couldn't uh, find the time to do it, was a plot, you know, of, of this, uh, mm, for example, value oscillating over time if you train it uh, uh, on multiple times on these alternating losses. Um, okay, so I think that we can take a little break now, five minutes break, uh, and then we will start with the second part of the lecture.
Okay, uh, welcome back. So do we have some questions uh, related to what we have seen so far? Okay, all good in class. Uh, what about at home? There's, there's one question. <laughs> uh, so Elliot asked, I think this has uh, first problem with a good example of concern I have. Okay. Uh, in this example, the model fits to the new data and forgets the old data, but isn't that actually a good thing? Hmm. Doesn't the red line better represent the current and thousand market than the bot in line? Mm, that, that's a very interesting question. In fact, it brings uh, these concepts that are, uh, say, um, often ignored also in the reason that say literature in continual learning, deep continual learning, that is the idea of, um, let's say, um, learning un under concept drift, something that uh, was explained in the, in the past with this terminology. So uh, if you are in a, let's say, non stationary world, as we said before, it is often and also reasonable to forget about things that are not valid anymore in the world. So um, uh, this is something, of course, that depends on a specific problem you'd like to model. It would be nice to have a single algorithm that is able to both handle, let's say, accumulation of knowledge without forgetting, and at the same time, forget what's really uh, not relevant anymore. We don't need to, and it's maybe not, uh, not, not only not relevant, but even wrong to, to maintain. So in this specific case, I think that um, it, it, uh, it, it is reasonable to have a single uh, estimation price for the wall houses because you may have as a, uh, you know, a sale agent, uh, different houses also built before 2000 yet to sell. In this case, an overall, let's say, estimation of maintaining these two models would be better than just having the latest one of the new houses. So in this case, I think it is reasonable to assume that the best regressor, the general the, that we have seen before, uh, the, the best regressor is the, the most general we have seen before that is somehow taking into account all of these different examples. Any more questions? Okay, so I guess we can uh, get quickly to, I don't know why now this bar is appearing <laughs> here. Um, okay, now there is one. In the second loss history plot. In the first one, uh, iteration, we were calculating the loss over all data only, but the next one iteration, we are calculating over new data only, not combined. So how fair insights and comparison it makes to the loss comprising of all the data as seen in the first history plot. So I think the question is maybe related to comparing different outputs, mm -hmm. since data are different. But, you know, this is the, yeah, I mean, the, the objective of the, the demo was to, to show that if you get access, access indeed to all the training set examples related to the whole um, data set, then you can get a better overall estimation, different loss, uh, different uh, values of the weights. If instead you have access only partially to first to a first uh, subset and then to a subsequent one, then it's very difficult to uh, get to the same um, mapping function that would be the ideal, ideal one. So that's the main effort. Um, um, okay, so I think we can uh, we can move uh, quickly to the second, let's say, um, notebook that I prepared here for you uh, a, about a, a standard, let's say, common um, toy benchmarks for um, for <laughs> continual learning based on the famous MNIST data set. It's just this collection of images, black and white images related to unwritten digits from zero to nine. Um, Okay, so we're, we're going to see uh, how we can create a first permuted NIST common uh, example uh, and benchmark that is just uh, based on the idea of having different experiences and for each of those experiences have a different fixed permutation of the pixels uh, related to all the images uh, of the training set. So let's say we have 60,000 training images and uh, maybe more with the test images, the overall data set. Uh, then we would um, create a copy of it to a random fixed permutation of all the pixels uh, uh, for, for, for each of the different images. So the, the permutation is random, but it's fixed with respect to all the possible examples. Uh, and, um, and, and we can do this, repeat this for an unlimited number of times so that we get in the end an unlimited number of possible tasks of classifying these 10 different digits. This is a common, let's say, way strategy. I think the first paper to do it was the 
compete for compute paper uh, that introduced this uh, simple way of using the same data set and NIST that you create an unlimited number of tasks uh, that you can la learn uh, in this case for continue learning in a sequence. Uh, then another option uh, to use MNIST, a very fairly common option uh, to create a continual learning um, scenario would be to have for each experience just uh, uh, the examples related to a couple of classes. So in the first experience, you have just examples related to the uh, zero and one classes. Then for the second experience, you get examples related to two and three, for example, and so on and so forth. You get to the final 10 possible classes. So we are going to explore in the next lecture um, all, all, all these different options of just tweaking the data and creating your data streams uh, can be defined more formally as a different scenario for continuous learning with different implications in terms of complexity and uh, methodology that you can use to leverage the structure in data. Um, so for our example um, here, you can uh, again look uh, through the tab GitHub uh, on Google Colab, again within the Colab uh, uh, repository of Continual AI, and you can search for permuted and split MNIST notebook, uh, open it as before, and you get to the second, let's say, not that I wanted to show to you guys and uh, after a brief uh, introduction here um, and uh, some instructions how to connect the local runtime if you want to run it even locally what are the dependencies of course these are python notebooks so you can download it change it use uh, Jupyter python uh, Jupyter um, um, tools to, to run it even locally uh, no problem and um, but you can use uh, I, I suggest you to use Google Collaborate for for convenience and well after a brief introduction now to 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 use Colab and also some interesting questions that you may explore if you are not really familiar with it for example how you can connect to Google Drive to Colab so that you can access data directly from that um, we start with just um, using PyTorch um, and uh, so PyTorch is uh, installed already in the virtual machines of Google Colab. That's nice. So you can just import it. Uh, you can see that. Oh, uh, well, maybe I can. Yeah. Um, yeah, edit. Mm. I think it is it, automatic. Um, Yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, so if you see here, you get um, you know, Porch is imported correctly, and uh, CUDA is available indeed here. Uh, if you if you run these comments that, uh, for example, show the availability of your GPUs, you have a, like a Tesla K80 here available for you directly enabled uh, in, in Google Colab. Uh, it may, you may not have it, right? Because <laughs> you don't have guarantees that you will have it, but uh, you may check uh, normally as you would do on your laptop, well, what are the current, let's say, what's the current state of the memory, the disk, and uh, the, the GPU that you may have. Hmm. Then uh, after a couple of imports for, from Torch, I'm not going to go through them, a NumPy that we are going to use again, uh, and uh, Torch uh, fans, uh, uh, sorry about this. <laughs> um, and uh, then the matplotlib to to plot results. Then we can move to the actual, um, say, download and, and creation of our per permuted MNIST uh, benchmark. So what we do is to uh, use uh, these um, scripts for simplicity that um, we have already within the Colab um, um, project uh, in, in continuous AI, so that we can just import MNIST just using MNIST.init. So automatically this tool, I guess we can update it with, uh, with the Avalanche uh, uh, tools here to do this. But yes, we have a script to just download the data from the official MNIST uh, uh, website. And, um, and so we, we, we download them, we uh, unzip them, and we, we do everything so that we can actually load from this object the train and test um, data and for each of those sets 
we have the X uh, and the T target values. So the actual images and the labels. And so we, we define these four uh, different uh, tensors, X train, T train, and X test, T test. So if you look at the dimensions, uh, it's what we expected. So 60,000 images, 28 by 28, one uh, channel, grayscale, they are grayscale, and uh, then um, int, uh, int uh, integers uh, values for the 60,000 targets that we range from zero to nine. Um, then uh, for the test set, we have the same structure, the same um, dimensions with instead 10,000 uh, different examples. That would reasonably represent uh, the, the, the 10 digits in all the, the possible, let's say, um, conditions, visual conditions. So if you look at the images, I'll just plot here a few numbers, a uh, few uh, sequence of, of uh, four uh, images in the train set. One, two, three, four. The first four examples, we can see that the examples are really nicely shuffled. So they are not all examples related to the zero class and then all that. Uh, uh, so we have uh, four different examples of zero, four, one, nine. Okay. Uh, then we can uh, impose towards the use CUDA if that's actually available. We force uh, the randomicity, let's say, of torch to be initialized by this seed just for convenience. And then we can define in torch, uh, for those of you especially that are not confident already with the tool, uh, we can define a neural network uh, just using, uh, 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 let's say, um, uh, available methods uh, to create the parameters related to convolution, uh, some functions related to uh, dropout, for example, and uh, linear layers that you can you can put into your uh, custom models. You can try different uh, topologies here, of course, is not really the point of this notebook. So we have just a fully connected layer that is doing like this hidden layer um, on top of uh, the feature extractor, and then you have the final output layer with, with uh, 10, 10 uh, different output neurons, as you would expect, the same number of the classes of the problem you want to solve. Okay, we run it. Then, of course, the forward method here is just, uh, um, let's say, the chaining of the different uh, layers so that we can get from the actual input X the result that we would expect in terms of estimated probabilities, um, uh, yeah, okay, we don't have the soft marks here, but uh, um, out uh, uh, of uh, of this uh, forward function for a particular image X or set of images. Uh, what we can do without even using the PyTorch data loaders uh, facilities, uh, just because we are hardcore, <laughs> uh, we can define a training method that just go over these uh, NumPy tensors using the slicing operators to take the mini batches. Uh, so that's uh, something you can do uh, just with range, simple range function in Python, just creating the end and the start at end, let's say positions of the slicing, and then taking out of the, the big, let's say, tensors of the X, Y tensors uh, for the training set or the test set, you can get out the slice, they're representing for you the mini batch, the current mini batch. And then you can um, as you would expect, uh, oh, convert uh, these um, these uh, mini batch uh, from uh, from uh, NumPy to a torch tensor, and uh, then um, start the optimization part. That in torch can be written simply as the optimizer. Uh, yes, yeah, we can initialize it. Uh, you know, forcing a zero grad, uh, uh, removing all the previous gradients accumulated eventually, uh, then computing the output. Uh, of the model, the forward the method of the model, starting from X, computing the loss, for example, in this case, a cross entropy loss function, uh, doing the backward step, that is computing the actual gradients, accumulating them, and do an optimization step of the our gradient ascent algorithm. Then for the test, we could do the same. So we are doing the same thing, but instead of computing the gradients here, we are just, um, using the function torchinograd to, to not actually take um, track of all the, the trace of all the possible um, chaining, uh, forward chaining operations. And uh, without accumulated gradient, what we do here is just to convert the slice, slices, the actual mini batches of the test set into torch tensors, 
x and y as always, compute the forward pass on the x um, um, examples and getting our estimated output and then um, accumulate uh, the loss if we want to plot it or do anything with it and then uh, um, take the maximum probability to just uh, get the actual prediction of the specific class. So the, this particular example, for example, belongs to. And once we have this prediction, uh, then we can uh, check if this prediction is the same as the actual target value, why, uh, and uh, increment our counter with respect to the number of examples we nailed uh, that we, we currently predicted, right? So this is, uh, how you could def define a train and test method directly in Python using NumPy's and just, uh, let's say, PyTorch for the custom, uh, let's say, um, model definition, optimization, uh, and uh, algorithm, yeah. So, uh, okay, so what we could do then, once we have defined these couple of, of methods, so we can create uh, a model, just instantiate the Angular net object, moving to the appropriate device and GPU, and then also create uh, an optimizer object that in uh, PyTorch you can define as opting.sgd uh, giving to these, um, these um, optimizer the parameters of the model, the learning rate 0.01 in this case, and the eventual momentum, for example. So then uh, the optimization step uh, for a number of epochs, in this case three, is just uh, um, call of a different, um, for, for, for several times of the train function we have defined before. And then since we want to test the model performance after each epoch, we can put also this additional function here in test, given, uh, uh, giving to these methods the, the actual model, the device on which we want to operate, and the appropriate, let's say, uh, tensors, and eventually the optimizer in the epoch for uh, the, the, the train function. So, if we run this code, um, uh, we, oh yeah, for, for two epochs, uh, then um, what we get is already after one epoch, 90% uh, accuracy. Uh, so we are able to distinguish these 10 different classes, digits um, uh, with 90% accuracy. And as we go on uh, with this particular model, we get to 94% uh, accuracy at the end of just two epochs. Okay, so this is uh, what we would expect, right? So we are able actually to, to solve this task with a reasonable eye accuracy. And of course here you can ask yourself some basic, let's say deep learning questions if you're not familiar too much with it. So uh, so, so how we, you can come up with some uh, the different type of parameters that work in this case, uh, how you can change the architecture, how that effect impacts uh, the results and, uh, and, and try out different model topologies that uh, and, and uh, make your own hypothesis out of it. Just, just yep. from uh, here, Sumiadip uh, asked uh, that uh, exactly the last question, uh, like to use a forward model instead of a convolutional. Yeah, <laughs> it makes sense. It makes sense. For, for this case, um, there are many reasons why this makes sense. So in this case, uh, but first one being that, um, well, in, in this, for for this, you don't actually need uh, robustness with respect to translation and uh, and other properties that would uh, be enabled by convolutional neural networks and uh, and so um, it is reasonable on on, uh, on MNIST to work with just MLP. So you can try uh, different topologies here again and just I don't know why uh, uh, I put this here, but uh, yes, it works, it works. <laughs> and uh, you generalize well with the problem. So um, um, then then. Uh, how we can define um, this? So I think for the sake of time and also uh, the interest of the discourse, uh, uh, you can take this uh, function as uh, let's say assume. So we have a function to do the actual permutation. You can look these in details at home, but essentially you get the MNIST data set composed of these different tensors we have seen so far. And uh, then with a given seed, you can create a random permutation uh, going over the different sets of the terrain at that set of MNIST, okay? So we can define these functions that we, we have this utility and we can create a second, let's say, task in which instead of having the, the natural images described in these classes, we have this fixed permutation. So, so as humans, we are not able to distinguish them anymore, but the task is reasonably on, in line in terms of complexity with respect to the first one for a machine. Um, and this is not really true in a sense because, um, so, so let's say that the complexity is the same 
across different permutations, not really uh, from the natural uh, images case, the first one of the real MNIST data set. But yeah, let's, let's, uh, it, we'll see that in, in the results. So, uh, okay, so we, what we are seeing here, just a plot of the same images, image uh, with, the, with this random permutation, okay? So this is the same image uh, of these different sets. Uh, one is the, the first original one, and the second one is the, the permuted one. Okay, so, um, so let's see how it works, our model that we just trained on these two different uh, tasks. Um, so on the first task, as we said already, uh, it achieves 94% of accuracy on natural MNIST images. But if we see how the model performs on this uh, permutation, then we see that this is actually random guessing. Right? So, so it's not able to, to distinguish one class to the other in this particular uh, you know, complex example, as you would expect, right? Because it's able to recognize it with this kind of shape and contours and 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 um, and, um, and uh, visual cues, but it, it, it is, this one is completely different. Um, but then, so one would say at this point, okay, we will just update. So let's just fine tune this model to also uh, update the weights and consider these loss on this new task. So we just um, do a, let's say a couple more epochs on X train two, that is the train and test uh, sets related to the um, second permuted uh, NIST task. And so we see that the, the loss is decreasing and the accuracy is growing. We get to now 82% in this case on the permuted task. Um, but then if we test the model uh, first on the on the on the first, let's say, original MNIST data set test and then on the permuted test, then what happens is that we have completely, almost completely, not completely um, erased uh, the knowledge we had to distinguish the classes related to the original MNIST data set. And we're now able, uh, we, we have pseudo, let's say, only the, the new data distributions related to the permuted task. And this is what uh, we would uh, call catastrophic forgetting uh, with MNIST in this permuted MNIST example. So you can explore additional questions here. Um, so um, when this MNIST data set has been introduced, ah, here is the link that I was saying before, uh, the paper I was mentioning before, then uh, if, uh, for example, if you use standard regularization techniques, L2, L1, drop out, look how they impact on forgetting. You can also look at uh, and how, uh, let's say, different topologies of the network also impacts on forgetting. This is something that um, you may explore more in details at all. Okay, so uh, just to move quickly um, to uh, a, a more, let's say, complex um, uh, scenario for continual learning where we have three tasks. Uh, we start again just by defining the task one as the original MNIST data set. Uh, task two as a permutation of the same, takes permutation with the one as the seed for the permutation as a different seed for a different task and a different permutation indeed. And then we are defining essentially our set of three experiences as three different tasks uh, we just defined. Then uh, we reinitialize the model optimizers that we are sure we start from scratch this time. And we can uh, look uh, again at the same uh, basic uh, naive or just fine tuning strategy, just continue back propagation over time uh, over these three tasks. And we see that we are able uh, after, let's say, the first um, let's say training on the first task zero to 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 work well on the first data set, and we, as we move on, we are able to reasonably um, solve the task one. And uh, as we move on on the third ta data set, we are able to 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 solve the second task, but we are unable to solve any more the, the first two, as we would expect uh, as an extension, as an inductive <laughs> extension of the experiment we've seen before. Um, so uh, one of the basic, uh, let's say, uh, upper bound that you can maybe construct to compare your own strategies, and we're going to discuss this uh, uh, when we talk about the baselines in terms of methodologies, would be to just accumulate all the data related to the training sets you've seen uh, before in, in the sequence of experiences over time, and you train your model from scratch, as we discussed before. Uh, so this is implemented uh, in, uh, in very simply in, in the PyTorch uh, after the definition of a shuffling function. Because remember that if data are not shuffled uh, with a unique training set, 
even though you have all of them together, if you process by mini batches and these mini, well, if you process these um, these um, big data set uh, with mini batches, uh, even though they are random, uh, you, you may end up with uh, with uh, with not the the best results. So the best way to uh, achieve the maximum performance is to shuffle all the data after all of them together of the different tasks and this is a function to do it and of course you, you need to shuffle in unison let's say the the the, the, the um, well both the x and the y so uh, to be sure that they match in the end uh, still uh, still uh, you know the, the examples the images and the labels okay so after uh, we have defined this function we reset our model uh, we can uh, work uh, over the different tasks um, in, in an iteration, uh, but instead of just uh, training on top on, on the current, let's say, examples of the task, what we do is to, in this four, to concatenate all the examples um, related to, to um, the tasks we have seen so far. So after we have uh, concatenated all these uh, tensors, we can sh use the shuffle in unison, in unison function, and then we can uh, loop over all these examples, shuffle the examples with a couple of epochs, for example, and, and get the final result. So in this case, we would expect indeed to have good accuracy over time uh, on all the, the three different tasks, right? Because we are actually using all the examples related to the experience we encountered so far. So for example, here, at the second task, we are now able to remember how to solve and distinguish the different images related to the different natural amnist um, classes, but we're also able to recognize the permuted ones with the same model. At the end of the last task, we are able to solve all of them together. So we are now expanded our knowledge, right? What we would want uh, to solve two permutations and still recognize these classes in natural MNIST data set. This is nice. So that it, it, uh, this is important it, it concept. So it does exist as so an overall solution that is uh, able with a single model to solve all the different tasks. So this is, let's say, uh, also um, um, a way that you can use to, to actually check if it is indeed possible with a specific model, model topology, a limited number of parameters to achieve good results that would solve all the, uh, let's say, um, overall continuous learning problem and minimize the L of S uh, that we defined before uh, mm, loss function. Okay, then, uh, uh, so this is uh, what we, we, we call, we, we uh, accumulative, let's say, strategy. So this idea of accumulating patterns and retrain uh, the, the model from scratch or update, maybe the model from the latest, um, um, from the one that you obtained in the previous step. And, uh, but then uh, another important baseline would be uh, what's called the joint train or offline sometimes strategy. That is just um, um, uh, wait till the end, let's say, of the sequence, accumulate all the data and train just one time from scratch. So that this is, the, the, let's say, the multitask. You can consider it a multitask um, um, approach uh, in which you, you actually are, are, are um, it, it's not like say, a continual learning strategy. It's not just a baseline you can use to control um, the, the, the results. So even in this case, uh, we just uh, instantiate the model optimizer from scratch again. And uh, well, what we do here is just to concatenate one time uh, all the examples and uh, um, optimize our model on top of them. And you can see that you get kind of uh, the same results and the community strategy. Indeed, if you plot the results here, you see that the, the, the joint training, let's say um, upper bound, uh, this is often called an upper bound, is around 90% to solve all the three tasks. Uh, there are no actual, let's say, points here, just uh, for convenience, I just replicated the single results that we have. So it's just a, a straight line uh, parallel to the to the tasks, um, uh, to the X axis that um, gives you an idea on what you can do with the single model training all the tasks together, right? And then you have the community strategy that is somehow growing over time because it is accumulating and retraining from scratch every step. So it is actually then at the end of this task, the same kind of the same of the uh, our upper bound here, the multitask joint training strategy. 
And then you have the naive core of ear that is not able to learn over time, as you, we have seen in the first part of the lecture, is a flat accuracy curve, essentially. Um, so, um, since I wanted to talk a little more about uh, Avalanche, uh, I, I think that you can look at the continue, let's say, of this uh, notebook at home, where I define like a simple split MNIST function that you can use to create your own, let's say, sequence of experiences based on a particular split of the natural, let's say, uh, original MNIST data set. So I don't know if we, if we have, you have some questions at this point to, to this particular notebook and this problem we have described as the permuted split MNIST. There's been a little discussion. <laughs> you are applying well, online, actually, um, on the output layer in class incremental to split them. Oh, yeah. Well, well we're going to discuss that both. Um, so, so this is going to be more clear, not only f just for, from the next lecture, which we are going to talk about scenarios and benchmarks and, you know, how you can classify these different streams of data. Um, and we're going to um, give a few hints about that as well. But I think we're going to cover that mostly during the methodologies uh, lectures uh, uh, in which we talk about uh, different, for example, architectural strategies that you can use to do address forgetting and, and add, for example, new output neurons, new classes over time. Yeah. Yeah, that's a possibility. That's a possibility that we're going to discuss that um, uh, soon enough. Okay, so um, moving back to the slides then. Um, okay, I, I guess I, we are going to skip this brainstorming session, but you already start thinking about possible ways in which you can uh, maybe address this problem of forgetting with your own intu intuition. So you can look at these questions to uh, would trigger maybe some, uh, some interesting ideas from yourself. I think it's nice to start uh, you know, brainstorming and, and think uh, of these without looking too much at different papers and solutions that are out there. I think it stimulates in you a bit of creativity and maybe you end up with uh, nice new uh, original ideas that you can uh, follow up within the, the, the exam and, uh, you know, your own explorations of the problem. I think this is also very nice and uh, maybe you can discuss in small groups and uh, and, and see where you can get, and then uh, we will discuss about the eventual, um, eventual uh, proposed strategies uh, later on in the course. Um, then, uh, yeah, just a quick notice. Um, uh, I think it's important to not, let's say, um, reduce the problem of continual learning just to forget thing. Uh, so in continual learning, there are many interesting other ideas. It's just that forgetting is a, a self-evident prominent failure of current uh, ML system. So that's why we studied in continual learning is one of is 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 known to be one of the main issues of machines that can learn continually, especially through gradient ascent. And uh, it's it's something that we 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 talk a lot in our community and we we design methodologies that could reduce and tame this issue. But continual learning is much more than that. So I, I'm actually very eager to move forward and and uh, you know discuss some much more interesting topics uh, within the stability plasticity dilemma. Uh, you know efficient learning in terms of memory computation, backward and forward transfer, compositionality of of knowledge and learning, robustness, learning to learn, affinities with meta learning. You know, the different things are related to the landscape of continual learning. Uh, so um, just uh, um, a few words about Avalanche. Uh, uh, this tool uh, was born within the, the continual learning community as an end-to-end -end continual learning library uh, based on PyTorch that would help practitioners and enthusiasts uh, to work on continual learning, especially for prototyping, especially for reproducing uh, results that would be made uh, public by the research community. Uh, so this would enable anyone to, this is at least the goal that we, we aim for, to write a bit of less code, especially for the like, more or less um, more engineering parts of experiments and, and res uh, research and development um, applications. Uh, prototype a little faster, reduce the errors that you can make, and, and in the end improve, improve reproducibility, uh, modularity and reusability with this uh, let's say, um, idea of increase uh, transparent, transparently the, the code efficiency and portability of your solutions as well. So if you develop a solution with Avalanche, the idea would be that you're, it's easy to test it on different settings, different scenarios, porting to different scenarios within the continual learning proposed um, benchmarks, and also uh, to uh, bring those to different hardware settings as well. Um, 
And um, so in the end, this means, especially for researchers, be able to also to augment the impact of your own research. So this is a very, let's say, a win-win situation for everyone, I believe. Because on one side, we're able to collect all different uh, baselines and approaches that we are able to reproduce fast, so we move faster as a community. But then also it's a way so that you can make to the other researchers your results available instantly just by making a pure request to a shared code base. So it makes sense to me that we should invest more on a collaborative code base that is controlled, in this case, by a non-profit research organization. I think this is kind of a unicum uh, within our even uh, machine learning landscape where in general these um, uh, open source access tools are, in, are indeed controlled by for-profit organizations. Um, and uh, so uh, I'm going to skip the main avalanche design principles are more of, um, let's say, standard uh, practices for a good uh, software development, um, open source development. Uh, what, do, what I want to stress is that, that the idea behind avalanche is to provide uh, like basic building blocks that you can use to create your own research lines, your ideas, uh, mostly from scratch. So the idea is that we wouldn't impose to you a way to reason and think about continued learning, but just provide you with the basic tools and utilities and functions that you can plug and play uh, to create your own ideas and, and expand uh, the horizon, let's say, of continued learning. So that's the main assumption behind Avalanche, should be simple. Uh, modular and, and easy to understand. Um, and you can use part of Avalanche uh, regardless of what you use um, uh, or, or, or other parts of Avalanche that are maybe more complex with respect to what you want to achieve. Okay, so just to conclude, I want to thank um, the the main maintainers and contributors of, of Avalanche that uh, actually are, are, keep, are keeping uh, Avalanche product uh, uh, maintained over time. I hope we can... Uh, have uh, an actual beta release uh, by the end of the year, so that's the plan. And sorry again if you find some art patches uh, the on the documentation and different bugs that may arise. Uh, but uh, this is a, um, uh, a nice operative skeleton, let's say, on how Avalanche works uh, in practice. So you have the benchmarks module that is uh, in charge of handling the data streams, so you can create uh, through this module, different data streams according to your needs. So starting from a set of data, you can create your stream of experiences. Then um, through the training and models uh, benchmarks, you can uh, directly in integrate, implement uh, interesting continuous learning strategies already implemented for you maybe uh, to learn from each example, uh, each experience, um, um, content uh, uh, in, in time. And then what's nice about Avalanche that you have uh, all these the evaluation metrics and logging facilities uh, transparently available for you. Uh, so uh, you can, for example, develop a particular plugin, a particular method within Avalanche, and uh, you get transparently out of the box all the uh, metrics, uh, you can define, of course, new ones, but you get all the metrics and the logging facilities, for example, TensorFlow or TensorBoard and OneDB uh, directly, uh, you know, describing the evolution of these metrics over time uh, live uh, in your experiment. So everything is, is in place for you to just work on the new design, new interesting methodologies. And so this that's the main idea behind Avalanche. Uh, so if you're interested, you can, of course, look at the official website of Avalanche, avalanche.org. And uh, here I just um, um, linked also the essentially the, the permuted means example we've seen before in the notebook uh, implemented in Avalanche. And you can see that it's just an handful of lines of code. So instead of uh, writing everything uh, from scratch, a whole notebook of code, you can just um, use uh, the methods and utils uh, offered in Avalanche and uh, have a nice and clean outer loop to give you access directly to the computed metrics you are interested about. We will discuss this more in depth, looking at different uh, modules of Avalanche over our explorations in this course. So uh, I hope you, you're excited uh, um, and uh, as me uh, to, to go through all these different notebooks we have created for you. Uh, so next time, uh, next lecture, we're going to see explore uh, different scenarios and benchmarks uh, for continue learning. So I hope you will get a, a better idea, not comprehensive, I guess, but uh, at least an idea on how 
uh, we can define different scenarios, interesting scenarios for uh, uh, interesting use cases of continual learning. Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, if we don't have any questions uh, from the audience here or from home, then I guess that we can close this lecture. Thank you so much again and see you uh, uh, next week.